talking about instruments in worship? Are we really making a bigger deal than it needs to be when we talk about communion offered at a Saturday afternoon wedding? So, you know, who's really off here? Even if Jesus was saying that they needed to be paying attention to the weightier matters of the law, he wasn't at all telling them not to follow the law, was he? No. See, what they do, and you're jumping ahead of me a little bit because I'm not done with the verse. Look at the last thing that he says. These things, these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So what Jesus does is all of the law needs to be followed and all of the law should be considered important. And that you can't ignore the mint deal and coming. You can't ignore that. It's still a part of the law. These things you ought to have done, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, without neglecting the others, the mint deal and coming. And so they stop too short on what Jesus is saying. We do not have permission to go beyond what is written. We don't have permission to ignore what God says about instruments in worship, about communion, about the role of women, uh, and on and on it goes. So all of verse 23 needs to be taken into consideration. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, that probably got a few chuckles. Maybe outright laughter. Because it's a funny image of somebody that has a bowl of soup. And they are carefully straining to make sure that there are no little bitty buds in them. Because that would defile them. Meanwhile, they're reaching over here and taking a big bite out of a camel, which is an unclean animal, and would defile them instantly. I mean, it's a funny image. But that's what they're doing. They're, they're not getting what it is that God is considering faithfulness. And then, woe number 5, verses 25 and 26. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and of the ditch. But inside, they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Now, what they're blind to is the fact that they have made themselves look good on the outside, but have failed to examine the inside. How ridiculous would it be for somebody to grab a bowl or a dish and examine its cleanliness just on the external. Now, it's been my experience and probably your experience in washing dishes that the outside typically gets pretty clean. Mm -hmm. When I clean a bowl, I'm scrubbing the inside. Isn't that what you do? And in the process of scrubbing the inside, the outside, which is usually not as dirty, becomes clean in the process. And then maybe a quick wipe on the outside and you got the bowl clean. But how ridiculous would it be to spend all of your attention scrubbing the outside of the bowl and you've got food on the inside that is dried and stuck to the bowl. But the Pharisees are doing this very thing morally. They're taking considerable time making sure that they're dressing the parts and they've got the phylacteries and they've got the tassels and they've got the look. And when someone sees them, they exude holiness. They exude spirituality. But they're blind to the fact that they've never scrubbed the inside. They've never worked on who they truly are deep down inside, in their mind and heart, soul. On 
on this. I mean, it's a little bit of a rabbit, but in our LNR class, we had to look up the mission about washing of hands. And in there, you know, you could take a vessel that was made of cow poop and clean your hands. Is there any rhyme or reason how they came up with that? I mean, it, it just blows my mind how they could assume that that was okay. Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, it was just a long history of, of uh, you know, rabbinic things. And as far as there being any logic to, to it, I'm not, I'm not sure I've ever read that. Because, I mean, even if you read it a little bit farther, and it talks about as long as the water is sanitary to the point of cattle drinking it, it's okay. Well, I mean, I've seen cattle drink some pretty nasty stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Makes no sense. Well, we ought to also heed a warning here because there have been many preachers through the years that have had the appearance, the presentation of really being men of God. Uh, and people have believed the persona, they believe the external, and you can do it. You can pull it off. Everybody in this room is capable <coughs> of pulling the people on what kind of man you are. But deep down inside, you are as filthy and dirty and sinful as these Pharisees were. So, you know, Jesus' call is just be honest for a change. Use the mirror of God's word and, and take a really good look at yourself. And be real. Be who you are. Cleanse the inside and then the outside is going to be fine. Because if on the inside I don't have any dirty thoughts, then I'm not going to do dirty things. If I on the inside don't have filthy language, then I'm not going to be saying anything filthy. If in my mind and heart I've got a genuine love for God, then that's just naturally going to show on the outside. You can't hide it because that's who you are. And so that's why they're blind and that's why they're hypocrites is because they had to work so hard to convince people that they were one thing when in fact... They were something else, and they knew that they were something else. Okay, woe number 6, verse 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. A very similar uh, point to the last one. But a whitewashed tomb. I remember uh, Warren Wilcox telling a story about uh, a wealthy family's uh, girl who died, I, I don't remember how she died, but her, her beauty was stunning. She was, I mean, I think she was a teenager, but uh, unbelievably pretty. So the family decided that they wanted to preserve the beauty, and so they spent tens of thousands of dollars for a specially made casket that had a window that would be above this girl's face and that people for years to come in this airtight uh, casket would be able to see her beauty. Okay? But over the course of time and maybe through heat and cold expansion, there was a crack in the glass. And now that airtight compartment uh, was no longer airtight. And once air got to the body, it started decomposing. And so now people were going and they were looking into this glass and seeing not a beautiful young girl, but seeing the various levels of decomposition. 
which is really gross. <laughs> it's really gross. And so the beauty that was there was that which now Jesus is describing. These caskets that they were, were putting people in were whitewashed. And this is something that goes back all the way uh, to ancient Egyptian practice of the um, uh, sarcophagus and the, 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 the stonework and the painting and the artwork uh, that was done uh, even with these uh, rock or cement caskets. The Jews did the same thing. These wooden caskets are sometimes uh, these uh, uh, molded or cemented type caskets were very ornate, beautiful. But we all know what's inside. And it isn't pretty. Well, so also with these uh, scribes and Pharisees, they looked so good, but inside were full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. All right, then, woe number 7, verse 29. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. They had a system that reminds me very much of what you see in modern-day Catholicism. As we were traveling uh, throughout Rome, Kathy and I, in January, we stopped at a lot of Catholic churches. And in every Catholic church, there is a saint. Every Catholic church has relics. And uh, you've got these monuments to uh, saints and to men that have worked in that particular church through the centuries. And so you've got a side room here and a side room there and a side room there. And every one of those rooms is a monument to this particular former priest or a cardinal or something that uh, was involved in that particular church. Well, they're beautiful rooms. They're ornate. They've got flowers. They've got a beautiful uh, casket. Uh, and Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you take the tombs of these people that you venerated uh, and lift it up and say that if I had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So in a similar way, they venerated people of old, although the difference is they were truly recognizing the prophets of old, genuine men of God. These uh, in the Catholic churches were those that were certainly not preaching the truth. So that's where the analogy falls uh, short. But they were saying, if we were living in the day of Jeremiah, we would never have treated Jeremiah the way they treated him. We were living in the day of Isaiah. We never would have done what they did to that great man of God, Isaiah. <clears throat> Consequently, you bear witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Now, we have the adage, like father, like son, uh, which, by the way, is not in the Bible anywhere. But did you know, like mother, like daughter, is in the Bible? You know, I was constantly throwing out little tidbits. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you talk about a son of something that's called the Hebraism, and the Bible is full of them, and we talk about sons of light, well, that means that you are manifesting the characteristic of your father who is light. That's what sons of God is in Hebraism. You are manifesting the characteristics of your father. You know, people say that, Denny, I'm, I'm just Jerry all over again because I have so many characteristics just like my dad. Well, that's this Hebraism idea. Well, you are sons of the very same people that murdered the prophets. Verse 32, fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. Right. You've already put yourself on that course to continue doing what it is that they're doing, and you're going to wrap it up with the greatest offense of all, and that is killing not a prophet, but the very Son of God. 
And it doesn't get any worse than that. Is he standing there? Yeah. I hear a banjo. Who is that? Dan Owen. Kyle Owen. All right, verse 32. You serpents, you brood of vipers. Let's go ahead and borrow a term that John the Baptist used in Matthew 3, 7. How shall you escape the sentence of hell? There is nothing good, no nobility, no honor, no spirituality in anything that they're doing. So how can they avoid hell? Jesus apparently believed in hell. Olstein may not want to preach it, but uh, Jesus had no problem laying it out and saying, that's exactly where you guys are going. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. All right, when you talk about the early church, it was filled with apostles and prophets, men that were endowed with the Holy Spirit that had uh, gifts that enabled them to discern spirits, to do miracles, to prophesy, to speak in tongues. The, the early church was inundated with these people that had these manifestations of the Spirit. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Well, we know that James was the first martyr among the apostles. We know that Peter was crucified and that he asked to be crucified upside down. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. <clears throat> well, we know and read about Saul that chased after the Christians, wanting to persecute them from city to city in the book of Acts. That upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Jesus is saying, all of the righteous men that have been martyred from A to Z. Because the very first guy to be put to death for doing what was right was Abel. The last guy to be put to death for doing what was right in the Old Testament writings was this guy by the name of Zechariah, which you can read about in Second Chronicles, which was the last book in the Hebrew Bible. So, even in this statement, by the way, and this is kind of aside how we got the Bible point, Jesus put his stamp of approval on the entire Old Testament canon of the Old Testament. Now, our Catholic friends want us to believe that Jesus used uh, the apocryphal writings and that they were a part of the Old Testament. If that's true, he would not have said from Abel to Zechariah. He would have also included uh, some of the references in the apocryphal writings. But they were not a part of the Bible Jesus used. They were not a part of the scriptures, the inspired word of God. And even a, a, a statement like from Abel to Zechariah indicates the Bible that Jesus accepted. Truly I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. All right, so the persecuting of God's workers and the ultimate uh, <clears throat> judgment of God against them is going to happen, Jesus says, within this generation. Now that terminology reminds us of what Jesus says again in chapter 24 and verse 36. And, uh, uh, 34, 24, 34. Uh, so there is a prophecy being made beginning here that says that within a generation of time, this is what is, is going to happen. <clears throat> O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. You know, this, the 
beloved city that you read about in Ezekiel chapter 16 that you know was a child that was born and was bloody and had all the wound fluid all over it and nasty and yucky. Nobody cared about the the baby Jerusalem except God. And God kept, took her and washed her and loved her. And then as she became a young woman, embraced her and took her to himself. The love that God had for Jerusalem is something that has a long, long history. It goes all the way back to the days of David. And God's extended expressions of love to this city are seen again and again. <coughs> being sent, trying to win that city back to God. And what does this city do to God's workers? They kill them. They stone them. How often I have wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. God wanted to love and embrace that city, uh, but she was constantly telling God, get away from me. Don't put your arms around me. So, behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Jerusalem, the house, is about to become desolate. All right, when we look at this chronologically, Jesus is saying this approximately 1833. He's just couple of days from the cross. In AD 70, in less than a generation, which is 40 years, all of this was going to come true. And the city was going to be left desolate. For I say to you, from now on you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is no longer uh, going to present himself on a public forum. Uh, his visibility is going to be something that is going to be uh, not as visible as it has been. But the next time they see him will be when they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, most scholars understand that to be me on Judgment Day. At the end of time. All right, chapter 24. You have a lot of notes in your syllabus. Um, they're numbered 84 to 88, but the PDF that you downloaded should be 87 to 91, although I've added some additional pages to it, so that might be um, a little bit off on that. The outline for chapter 24 is very important for you to know and understand. Verses 1 through 35 talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then verses 36 through 51 have to do with the end of time, the second coming. Now, there are many, many people <clears throat> who do not agree with this breakdown of Matthew 24. And especially any group that is premillennial will not agree with this uh, division. 1 through 35, destruction of Jerusalem, 36 and following, end of time. So, what I'm about to show you, you need to learn. Because these are what I consider to be ungetaroundable evidences that this division of Matthew 24 is exactly right. And that's going to then impact and change the way we interpret various verses within this most important 
chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. So, we've got the destruction of Jerusalem on one side, and we've got the second coming on another side. How do we know that verses 1 through 35 are talking about the destruction of Jerusalem? And how do we know that verses 36 through 51 are talking about the second coming? All right, here are those evidences. First of all, the destruction of Jerusalem has signs. You're going to have all these things happening. Wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes. You're going to see, verse 15, the abomination of desolation. Verse 27, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. You're going to see this. Verse 30, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Verse 33, Even so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. So we're talking about things that have signs, indicators, if you will, that what he's talking about is about to happen. You're going to get a forewarning. Then in verse 36, but of that day and hour no one knows. Why does no one know? Because there are no signs. There are no indicators whatsoever. As a matter of fact, verse 39, they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. They just didn't see it coming. They didn't recognize what was going on. Jesus says, verse 42, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Not going to give you any hints. Not going to give you any signs. Not going to give you any warnings. All right, secondly, notice the terminology. When he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, he makes reference to days. According to historian Josephus, the attack on Jerusalem started in April and went all the way through or into September, A.D. 7. So, it's logical that Jesus is referring to days here. Three times he uses the plural days. But notice, and this is exegesis at its best, notice how the plural days then suddenly is shifted to the singular day, starting with verse 36. You see the singular in verse 42. You see the singular again in verse 50. It is clear that we're not talking about the same thing. We're not talking about the same event. One event covers days, the destruction of Jerusalem. The second event happens on a day, and that's the end of time. Now, we don't 
need other passages to back this up. But just for the sake of your having this in your notes, Jesus talks about, in John chapter 6, that he says, verse 39, I will raise it up on the last day. And then verse 40, I myself will raise him up on the last day. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again and again and again in John chapter 6, Jesus hammers the singular day. Verse 54, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So, it's clear when we talk about the day of judgment, that singular day is used. Not just in Matthew 24, but also in other passages like John chapter 6. Alright, evidence number three. Is what in... English is called a demonstrative pronoun. A demonstrative pronoun is when you are demonstrating something. Seven times Jesus refers to those are these. Those things, those days. But then he changes from a plural demonstrative pronoun to a singular demonstrative pronoun in verse 36, that. But of that day. But there's more evidence to support this division of Matthew 24. And that is, in verse 34, Jesus says that what he has been describing, this generation is going to see. So they are clearly being told, it's going to happen within your lifetime. But, starting with verse 36, Jesus says, no one knows when this is going to happen. There is no time frame by which this event is placed. So obviously it can't be referring to the same thing that he's been talking about. It's got to be something different. <clears throat> okay, verse 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away. When his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, and he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? There's the first of the demonstrative pronoun that we were just talking about. Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. See, they were so proud of the temple. And in John chapter 2 and verse 20, it had already been under construction for 46 years. You, that was from where? 
John 2, verse 20. <clears throat> now, according to Josephus, <clears throat> in his Wars of the Jews, chapter 6, or book 6, chapter 4, the temple was burned and then was destroyed by the Romans. So you'll have stones left one upon another uh, when a structure is being burned, but they did more than that. They burned it and just basically dismantled it. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is east of Jerusalem. Uh, it's a very beautiful place even today with olive trees. Uh, and you have uh, an amazing vista of the city of Jerusalem as you, you look down and you can see all of Jerusalem. Uh, you can see uh, the, the Temple Mount. Uh, it's pretty cool to, uh, to visit. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now, scholars uh, are pretty unanimous in saying that the first question is in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem, which Jesus was talking about in verse 2, because they use the phrase, these things. When will these things be? All right, so... Uh, you just said that not one stone was going to be left upon another. When is that going to happen? Okay, that's question number one. Now, question number two, what will be the sign of your coming, may be referenced back to what he said in verse 39 of chapter 23. From now on you will not see me until you say... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, when's that going to happen? What will be the sign of your coming? And then a potential third question, and the end of the age. Now, they certainly were not thinking that the coming of the Messiah was going to be the end of the age, were they? Well, yeah, because the coming of the Messiah was going to be the onside of the Messianic kingdom and the Davidic kingdom that was going to be established in Jerusalem and that was going to be the dawn of a new age. <clears throat> so it's possible, although not <clears throat> completely uh, a slam dunk, that the last two questions were really the same question that were two events that were going to happen at the same time. And that is, you're, you come and the age is over. But what Jesus answers is, those really are two separate events. When will these things be is in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. And he'll answer that question first going down through verse 35. And then, the end of the age is that which is going to be discussed in verses 36 and following. <clears throat> By verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Now, if you and I were talking, and you had asked me some questions, and I started out by saying, make sure that you get this right. Because there are going to be people that are going to try to mess you up on this, and send you down a wrong course. So, make sure you get this right. Don't let anybody mislead you. As a matter of fact, you'll notice the word mislead again in verse 5, and you'll notice it again in verse 11, 
You'll notice again in verse 24. So, four times in this section, Jesus issues a warning about being misled. Don't be misled. All right. How, how could I be misled? Well, verse 5. For many will come in my name. There's our problem. You've got a blitz of teachers, preachers, who in my name, all right, through the authority of Jesus, supposedly, using the words of Jesus, supposedly, saying, I am the Christ. Jesus wasn't the Christ, but I am. He was the one that was pointing toward me. He was getting things set up for me. Who's going to buy that? I mean, come on. Jesus says, and will mislead many. Have you really studied much uh, about what Muhammad says about himself? Well, if you have, you would know that Muhammad says Jesus was pointing to me. You ever read much about Sun Yen Moon? Just died a couple of days ago. Sun Yen Moon said Jesus was pointing to me. Well, he predicted it right here, that this is going to happen. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. These people constantly living in a state of <clears throat> insecurity. They did. They were uh, a substate of the Romans. There was always this talk about the, the Romans were sick of the Jews. They were tired of dealing with the Jews. And they were going to do with the Jews what they had done to so many other cultures, so many other nations. Just annihilate them. Let's squash them like a bug and we'll be through with them. That was the Romans' M.O. And there was always this talk that they were next. The Jews were next. (coughs) See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. All right? They asked about the end of the age. That's not the end. There are always people that are pointing to wars and rumors of wars, pointing to earthquakes, pointing to natural disasters, pointing to Katrina, or pointing to the tsunami that hit Japan, pointing to the tsunami that hit um, uh, India, and say, wake up, folks. The signs are there. The evidences are there. Matthew 24 said that these are going to be things that are going to happen. But Jesus said, not the end. Have you ever been around somebody like that much that is just in constant fear? I mean, it absolutely consumes them. Yeah. If they let it. I worked for a guy most recently that, I mean, he had rooms and rooms full of food and this, stockpiled ammunition. I mean, it... Absolutely. Yeah, it's a consuming thing. Obsession. Um, Rudy has a teacher um, who has his doctorate in uh, something, I don't know what it is, but anyway, uh, in his syllabus, he only had it up till November because he doesn't believe they're going to be here past then. <laughs> and uh, so he said not to even worry about it, really. Um, and so if they don't miss, if they miss class, he doesn't worry about it because this is the end of the the earth um, in this semester. So if you missed, it's not going to be counted against you. Um, well, we yeah. all know that December of this year is when it all ends. Yeah. According to the, the Mayan calendar. Yeah. So. I thought it was not like the, the Mayan calendar. It was calendar. a bulk email. I wouldn't have started verifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, partially. I would have gone to Southwest. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, anybody that's watching this. Well, Albert. There's always that sort of uh, thing going on. He said, "That's not the end. For nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. 
But all these things are merely the beginning of birth things. All right, they're they're just things that are happening um, that are getting us closer to, but are not indicators of the end. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. So the persecution is that which is going to cause a lot of Christians to abandon Christianity. And the hatred, the venom that's going to be uh, spewed out toward Christianity is something that they're just not going to take it. And Jesus said, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. What happened between the death of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem are described by some as the most chaotic 40 years in all of human history. (laughs) With natural disasters to wars to famines to, I mean, a litany of things that were just going to rock your world so bad uh, that you don't know what, what to believe. Well, when you've got stuff like that <coughs> that's happening in abundance, you also are going to have verse 11. Many false prophets will arise. <clears throat> you know, just pay attention to what happens in the world when there's a major calamity and all of a sudden you get these TV evangelists that come on and, and who, who's this guy? Never even saw him right. before. And now he's got airtime, and, you know, he's saying, this was predicted in the Bible, uh, and gets a following, and so on. And Well, Jesus is saying, that's just the way it is, and that's the way it was from the 40 years from when Jesus predicted this to the destruction of Jerusalem. Many false prophets, and will mislead many. I hate that Jesus keeps using the word many, but he does. <laughs> Verse 10, many will fall away. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. They're not going to care anymore. Let's just do what we're going to do because we're, we're all going to die. So what difference does it make? Uh, I don't remember the guy's first name, but his last name is Hagee. Uh, he's one of the TV ministers. And uh, I caught a session of him, and I listened for a minute, because they get way out there sometimes. He said that the end of the world was going to be in December. But he would pray for us that God would extend it. I guess he's covering his track just in case it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> How does he get any better than that? That's, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the smartest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so if it goes longer, man, the power of prayer in this look guy. What I did. Wow, <laughs> look what he did. <laughs> oh, wow. So when he said the love will grow cold because of this, um, he essentially talks about this abandoning and faith. Because the love is good. Loss of tribulation, persecution, and love for God and love for fellow man is, uh, yeah.